Last game with stakes for Canada soccer. Oh, it's tomorrow, but I was, I was actually thinking about it on the, on the way in today. Again, I can be a little romantic about sports. I get pessimistic a lot of times. I feel like I'm in like two zones a lot of the time, actually. <laughs> I got like two registries. The two sides of JD. Yeah, it's like one is everything sucks and everyone's lying to you and it's all a scam. And then the other is just getting hyper romantic about what sports mean and bringing people together and relationships and connections, right? I'm that guy. I, I like, I cry during the, I get, I get choked up during the, the montages or the, the pregame videos that they put together. Like when it's Stanley cup season yeah, yeah. and they put those like, because it's the cup commercials yeah, together. Yeah. Like, yeah. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> this means a lot to me, <laughs> but get a little romantic about can of soccer. And maybe I'm an idiot. Maybe this is what I have uh, chosen my big idiot brain. But uh, I can't believe that they bucked the post-World Cup lull this way. That everybody's just completely back in on this program. They're sinking six million bucks back into Canada soccer. Like, they accomplished that by making it here in this bronze medal or third-place game. You got multiple young players that emerged that are... I think Cornelius Bombito and Schaffelberg, now all three of them, are in the household lexicon when it comes to just even a halfway casual soccer fan, right? Canada men's soccer fan. I think that those three guys really did acquit themselves well. They showed a little bit more depth. The team clearly can play with some poise. The coach that people had questions about has a swagger to him, an energy to him. I think mm-hmm. he's very likable. I actually, uh, I don't want to, yeah, I'll just do it. I always kind of found Her- Herdman's thing a little over the top where uh, just it didn't rub me the right way personally. When he did the, after the, Belgium game, he lost me. When they did that, when he did that against Belgium and moving forward, I was kind of out. I was a little out. Just felt a little corny, a little cheesy. This guy, Marsh, is more my style of guy. Smoking a cigar, talking a little trash. I like him. I just, I like the swagger. I like when he's swearing on the side. When they cut to him <laughs> when he's pissed, yeah. I go, that, that's a normal pissed off guy. It's not too over the top. It's a, it's a, good, it's a good zone to be in. I think that he's been a hit. Davies as a captain has worked out for them. Mm -hmm. They got a bunch of experience on the big stage and they didn't look overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. There were a few, you know, rough moments. They didn't score enough goals. That's clearly got to be the next thing moving forward. I I don't think anybody disagrees with that, but they played well defensively. Their young back line proved themselves. They probably need to improve the midfield a bit, but outside of this, it just feels like they're kind of back on track and now heading towards the world cup, which is what this was all supposed to be about. I feel like maybe they're going to ride a positive wave. I know the the long-term Canada soccer people, the the people who have covered them for a very long time and understand the infrastructure better than I do, they would probably say, yeah, uh, you, we've been down this road before. Didn't this feel that way during qualifying for the World Cup? But man, oh man, I just, I think the thing I'm leaving this thing with is real excitement about the future and knowing that this run maybe did help stabilize this program. And yeah, Canada's chances heading into the World Cup. Jeff Blair of Blair and Barker. Uh, he does baseball every day, but I'm giving him a, he's a soccer guy. That's through and through. That's the number one thing. You catch Jeff Blair sitting around the office and you see who he wants to talk to. It's the people who are talking soccer. He doesn't want to hear your baseball takes. <laughs> Jeff Blair, what's up, brother? How are we doing? Uh, it's amazing how that happens when the uh, baseball team sucks. Isn't it? Oh, <laughs> it's like yeah. my fall, my fallback sport, <laughs> yeah. soccer. No, but it's if if someone no, comes up to you and they're like, "Hey, Jeff, here's my Jays takes." You're like, "Yeah, thanks." Uh, what's the call in number? You used call the call in. All right, we do call in sometimes. If someone comes up to you and has like a Bundesliga take, you're in. You'll you're captivated. You'll you'll give that person some time. Yeah, I mean, that's a sport I played in high school, yeah. and um, I mean, I, I, you know, I lived in Germany for a while, and that's kind of where I really uh, sort of developed, I don't say a love for it, but certainly it was there every day, and mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's I, I enjoy it because I, I think there's a lot of similarities between soccer and baseball, and that mm. in both sports, it's pretty much all about the buildup. Right. And um, like I get people who say they I understand completely understand people who say they can't watch soccer because nothing happens uh, because there aren't that there aren't many goals. Uh, I get people who say they don't like baseball because the pace is too slow. I I get all that. But I kind of like the fact that generally 
in soccer, there's a buildup before something happens, right? Very seldom is there something that just, it's just out of the blue. Something happened because something else happened and somebody else made it pass and somebody else made a decision. So I, I like it for that reason, but yeah, listen, I, I'm with you with the, uh, with the Canadian men's team. Um, I covered John Herdman for two Olympics and, and a couple of competitions when he was the women's coach. Uh-huh. John Herdman in person comes across a lot better, I think, anyhow, than John Herdman, the person on TV yeah. or the person on radio. Like, I can see after spending some time around him, I can see why when he ran that women's team, he got such buy-in from his players. For I, sure. I think I, he I, spoke I at Christine Sinclair's get father's funeral. Like, he's he's clearly connected to those players. It's just for me, and you know what he does so theatrical. Yeah, you know, and and there's a reason for that. I think he, yeah. he's one of those rare guys. He has a knack. If you if you're talking to John Herdman in a in a news conference, he has a knack of making eye contact and making you seem as if you're the only person in the room mm. he's talking to. And I think that kind of ne- leads to a natural sort of theatricality, if that's a word. But I mean, I'm I, I didn't think he had a great World Cup. I didn't like the decision to let Alfonso Davies take that penalty kick. Yeah. Um, Jonathan David does that for his club team. His club team was a really good club team in, you know, is Liga on the same level as the Premier League? No. But it's it's a pretty significant league. It's a league that Kylian Mbappe plays in, for God's sake. So, mm-hmm. or did play in. So he lost me there because that to me was. That was a North American soccer decision. We've got a penalty kick. Yeah, Let's pick our best player, our greatest player to do it. No, how about picking the guy that has done it before for his club team and understands the process? So that is when I think a little bit of the veneer of John Herdman started to get chipped away. And then the whole thing with Croatia was just was ludicrous. Yeah. You know, newsflash. Yeah. Don't don't insult Croatian yeah. soccer players. Just yeah. just don't. I'm going so to when, when, I, when I saw I, that, I feel like I'm not going to talk about being Canadian. I think I might be the first Canadian to travel internationally put in a, like an American patch on my bag. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that, but <laughs> but I mean, um, the the new guy. Look, Jesse's Jesse's been knocked. First of all, the the CEO of Soccer Canada, Kevin Blue, is exactly the right guy to have in this position. You need somebody who can think outside the box. Getting MLS teams to pay for your head coach or to chip in money for your head coach was genius. I don't care how it looks. I don't care how the title looks. He was faced with a situation where he had a World Cup in a couple of years. He had a team that was coming off. uh, I mean, it wasn't a disappointing World Cup, for God's sake. Making the World Cup in and of itself is something. But he needed somebody who could come in and hit the ground running, get the attention of these players, and get them focused on a tournament. And, you know, Jesse March, is, was he successful at Leeds? Nope. But he coached there. Uh, you know, coached in, at, at Red Bull Leipzig. He's, he's coached in some pretty dynamic situations for some pretty dynamic owners with a lot of pressure on him. So I, th- I think he was a great choice. And, and the other thing I think we've seen in the, in the Copa that I, I don't think people who aren't soccer fans – don't understand enough there is a major difference between coaching a team in a league and Mm -hmm. coaching a team in a tournament a tournament it's literally all about getting a result on that day it doesn't matter how you do it you don't get brownie points you don't get bonus points for playing pretty football you look at england they're going to the euro final all we've heard all along during this tournament is how awful yeah. Gareth Southgate is as a tactician. Yeah, right. It's, it's ugly. There's an end. And the idea is to be part of the crew that are writing those final pages of the book. So, yeah, I think it was a, it's a great hire. Uh, the players look engaged. Mm-hmm. You know, he's got a few, I think, a few tactical things he needs to work out. I don't like Jacob Schaffelberg starting. Yeah. I think he's much better coming off the bench. You and in the 55th minute. Well, he, I mean... It, you know, when he comes off the bench, he's like he's like a nuclear weapon yeah. when he comes off the bench. All of a sudden now, you're matching him up for 40 minutes against a dude who's already been out there running for 55 yeah. minutes in the heat. So, But he'll figure that out. Yeah, he looked gassed, too, like when Marsh spoke post-game uh, after the Argentina match about 
hey, he thought that they looked tired around the 18 minute mark. I, I thought that he was referring yeah. to like him almost specifically where I went like, yeah, yeah we felt Schaffelberg those first few minutes. And then he just kind of disappeared from the game. And I was like, ah, I, don't, I don't know where the hell he went. Yeah. I, I really like Jesse Marsh. I feel bad because again, I jumped the gun and went, I asked it about him and he said that the guys in Leeds called him Ted Lasso. And that was enough for me. And I went, Oh, nightmare. <laughs> you know, that's I, that I really didn't need to hear that. He saw the, the pitching in for money and it felt like a desperation hire and I just looked at it on the the resume, and you even said, like, the Leipzig team where he had Holland. I go, man, if I know who your guy is at that level of soccer, that's not good. Like, that's that that can't be meaningful when it comes to your best results. But I just, I like him. I like the swagger. I like the attitude. The big tactic one to me, though, is do you like how he uses Davies? Do you think that he uses him this way moving forward? Like, is this how it stays? This is how it remains. See, I've kind of taken a, a counterintuitive approach to this. I yeah. understand. He's their best player by far. Yeah, no question. Um, and and the thinking is okay. Let's put Alfonso Davies in a in the position. Whereas the best player by far in this team, he's going to have the ball in a dangerous position more than anybody else. Mm. And I I like the way he uses Alfonso Davies because I think Alfonso Davies is more crucial to the build up than he is to the finish. And you know, if this team is going to score goals, I love Alfonso Davies. He can't be your leading goal scorer. If this team is going to score goals, it's got to be Jonathan David. Uh, they've got to find they've got to find somebody else uh, with the touch around around the net as well. So I like I like Davies where he is. Uh, I, I I really do. I also, um, I I just I I get the argument, and I you know what I wouldn't mind seeing. And it'll be interesting to see if Jesse Marsh ever does this. I wouldn't mind seeing f- maybe Alfonso Davies being flipped every now and then, mm. taken out of the position, and and maybe put it in a more a more offensive position, something that does allow him to get a few more opportunities uh, around the net. Because look, I mean, they still have some they still have some holes. I God love Liam Miller; he works hard and everything, but to me, he can't. He can't be getting the minutes that he gets right now. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? That's I mean, that's what tournaments like this are for. Yeah. Uh, finding out, finding out what Alfonso Davies can do. And this, and again, this works fine. This works fine if somebody else steps up. And if there's been a disappointing thing to me about this tournament so far, it's been the lack of finish for sure. Uh, in in front of in in front of goal. Yeah. That's the thing that I'm. I don't know how you coach that, J.D. It's like I've often wondered, how do you coach someone to be more relaxed when they have the ball at their feet or when they have the puck in their stick? I don't know how you do it. I think no. it just – I think it just – it's its something natural. It's something intrinsic. And I, I don't know how Jesse March handles that. But I'm not entirely certain that completely nuking your, your strategy – and putting more focus on Alfonso Davies addresses that situation. So to me, it's, it's, this is like, again, you ended up with the breakout from Schaffelberg. I think that the super sub theory has a, a lot of validity to it. Um, but that is something where it's like, I look at it and go, okay, you can create offense the way that this guy runs. They didn't have yes. Tejon Buchanan, by the way, for what, That's three of their point. more, most important games. And this was That's the guy that point. leaving the world cup, we all went, Oh, he's awesome. Like he's going to go play in Europe. Now he plays for Inter Milan. So, yeah. Losing him for a team that's not particularly deep when it comes to offensive pieces, I think was probably a little understated when they lost him just because Schaffelberg emerged and people kind of went like, oh, well, this guy replaced him, so it's totally fine. But if you're talking about your substitution theory, it's like, yeah, well, that's a pretty major dip. Um, With Davies, the only thing for me where I would want to see him in a more offensive role is that there were, what I think, two or three moments in that Argentina game, right, where he goes on runs, and he just starts barbecuing guys, where it's like, mm-hmm. okay, bye, bye. He goes by two, but he's not going by the third, right? And you're going, yeah. yeah, it's Argentina. That seems to be the way, and this is kind of all sports. It's like basketball, everything. How do you create space for others, right? Yes. And yep. they don't have the midfielders. Like, when they were trying to give it to Estacchio, and he's trying to, like, open guys up with passing, and you go, oh, there's a huge divide between a guy like that 
and the international midfielders that can pick you apart with the passing. One of the things that makes Canada special is those Davies runs that could open things up for others. And so for me, again, soccer new guy, don't really understand the sport, the intricacy, how many times a guy can do that even in a game is essentially beyond me. But to me, that would be one of the things where I go, this is clearly one of the ways that we can create offense that is at the highest level of the sport. Yeah, it's a great point. They really, you know, one of my favorite players is Thomas Muller for Germany. Mm -hmm. And his nickname in Germany, it's a German nickname, but his nickname is the space interpreter. Okay. And that's the English translation of it. And that's yeah, kind of... It's I, not a smooth, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and and um, I, I think that's kind of what Canada what Canada lacks right now in the yeah. midfield. They, they and, and I don't know if Ishmael Coney can be the guy. I'll, I'll be fascinated to see... You know, he's going to be playing in Marseille this year. That's going to be great for him because the, the French League is really athletic and he's going to be run out all the time. And he's going to have to make super fast decisions. So I, I, I think that's, I mean, I think that's an exciting thing for, for Canada soccer. I don't think we really know exactly what he is yet. Mm -hmm. I think he could, I wouldn't say this guy's the limit for him, but I think there might be something more in there than we've seen so far. But yeah, it really is. I mean, soccer's all about, it, it's like, I think basketball is a perfect, uh, you know, kind of the, kind of the perfect uh, comparison it is about space yeah. it's about using your space and creating space and 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 then when you do create the space doing something with it and and that's where i find sometimes with the canadian men's team that it's lacking that you can you can see the play develop you can see the opportunity and the number of times where a shot is either not taken mm -hmm. or turns into a pass or ends up over the net or ends up like bouncing feebly three or four times on the ground. That's the thing that really concerns me because you see that an awful lot. Yeah. But I, but again, I think you know he'll Jesse Marsh will is, will eventually figure out who he can rely on and who he can't rely on. And um, the the biggest thing is they needed to get somebody in here who could get everybody's attention right away because time's a wasting, right? And you yeah. and and you know, it'd be great. If Canada, if Canada could get a result in the third place game, but just the fact that they're competing with the top countries in the world, not being run off the pitch as used to happen, that's enough for me right now because I'm sure Jesse March and his staff, they'll have a ton of stuff on video after this tournament's done and they'll be able to figure some things out. I mean, I got to tell you the truth. I feel a lot better about the team where it is now than I did at any point under John Herdman. Yeah. I, I completely agree with that. And I, I'm with you in terms of uh, feeling that level of pride or contentment with where they have or how they have played in this tournament. Like, yeah, again, maybe you wish you had more goals. You wish you would have shown a little bit more finish. Oh, you had a few more opportunities. Like you were, you played two matches against Argentina and the world didn't go, oh, my God, how, how embarrassing was this for you? Like, but you know what else I like, too? I like the fact that they got under their skin. Yeah. You know, I like the fact that guys like Kone that was the and Bombito are – I. that's good. You yeah. want – you know what? You want to be able – because tournament soccer is not – we just talked about this. It's not always pretty. Yeah. I, it just isn't pretty. The number of really just awful games in this Euro has been yeah. remarkable. But that's the way – soccer is now and there comes a time where you do you just have to be filthy <laughs> you really do have to take a chunk out of somebody even if it means getting a yellow card and missing the next match there comes a time where you have to do that and this Canadian team for whatever reason I don't know if it's necessarily Jesse Marsh um, although I think certainly his the way he presses has a lot to do with it. Yeah. They've got some guys that will take a chunk out of you. Yeah. And when they do take a chunk out of you, you know, they face you. They yeah. face up to you. They don't turn around and walk away. And that's good. <laughs> that's really good. Yeah, I never saw Jesse Marsh play, but his face is, is the look of a guy that would also take a chunk out of you when he played. Like, the, just from seeing his face, I would go, that that's you. You would... Uh, you would highly endorse those things. Okay, so I hate to do this to you because I'm I'm having a lot more fun talking about the soccer team, but oh, we uh, can talk about the Jays. Yeah, the the team that is you said sucks. Uh, that <laughs> uh, okay, they put Kevin Kiermaier on revocable waivers, um, and I don't care what I, it's pretty self-explanatory why they would do that. 
But I thought Blake Murphy, um, our friend on Jays Talk Plus, he raised a good point about this, that if the Jays trim $11 million, they avoid repeater tax implications. And I think they Kevin Kiermaier comes in around like four and a half if he gets picked up by somebody. And I haven't seen anything yet, so I'm guessing that they won't. He's not going to get picked up. But where do you think the Jays are right now? Or do you have any read on whether this is a team that is going to look to really try and shed salary, not just like through the trades in terms of, you know, trading away the pending free agents or whether they're going to be a group that says in some of these trades, we're willing to take on some bad money in order to increase the prospect capital that is going to come back to a farm system that, yeah, as BNS pointed out in a great piece the other day uh, is in tatters. I mean, I, I think, I think not paying the repeater tax is important. Yeah. Um, yeah, it looks. Oh, look, do, do I think at the end of the day is that extra money going to make that much difference to ownership? I don't think so. But you know what? It's it's funny. We're seeing this more and more around baseball. I I think there are a lot of big market teams where if you go to the owner and say, you know what, give me another twenty million dollars and I can get a reliever, mm. and ownership will go okay. But then you go to ownership and say, you know what? If I get this reliever, it's going to put us into the luxury tax, and it's going to cost you $18 million. And the owner's going to go, wait, I'm not paying $18 million in tax to the Miami Marlins so they yeah. can screw around with their franchise. Forget that. So I, I think it, it makes sense that that's the approach the Blue Jays would take. It's what I would do. It's what the Anaheim Angels did last year when they were in kind of the similar situation to the Blue Jays. I guess it was the last year of Shohei Otani. You remember they went out, mm-hmm. made a whole bunch of trades, and two weeks later found they were out and said and, and just punted and basically put their entire team on waivers. Um, so, yeah, I, I think this is – I mean, every player goes on waivers at some point during the year. For Not every player. Most players go on waivers at some point during the year. Um, and and – I think you're going to see. I think you're going to see more of this. Uh, mm. And and you know there there might be players that teams would claim. Uh, clearly, I mean, I can't imagine. I don't know why anybody would claim Kevin Kiermaier. Uh, if they just I, watched I, the game yesterday, if they just saw what he did yesterday, then they yeah, would get him. N- no, <laughs> I, I mean, he, 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 yeah, whatever. Yeah, I, you know, yeah. I, he he's 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 a fifth outfielder on a really good team. Uh, that's the way I look at Kevin Kiermaier. Is, is there a team that's willing to pay four and a half million for that? Probably not. Yeah, I don't know. So we're going to see a lot more of these moves. I mean, look, you you look at this roster, and it's obvious who who they who they will likely get rid of, right? Mm-hmm. And it, I don't know what they'll get. I I tend to think you're going to see a lot of deals much like the Steve Pierce deal they made with the Boston Red Sox, where yeah. they got Santiago Espinal back. Um, you know, it would be nice if every player they got back in the trade went to an all-star game the way Santi did, but mm-hmm. I, that's probably, it's probably not, it's probably not going to happen. So yeah, I, I think this is, this is what you're going to see going forward. Guys are going to be in waivers and if somebody doesn't claim them, uh, I think in a couple of cases, the Jays may end up just releasing them. And, um, you know, as, as, as far as taking on money, I'm not certain. I, I think this organization would pay to move a player off of its own roster. I don't know if they would necessarily take somebody else's high-paid player mm-hmm. uh, because, again, it, it would have to it would have to balance out. If you do cut enough salary that you can do that. Maybe add somebody with you know ten million dollars left in their contract in order to get a better prospect from that team, and still stay under the luxury tax. You could do it. Okay. But um, yeah, I, I yeah that makes I sense. I really I don't have a handle honestly on what this front office is going to do. I, yeah. I I I truly don't. I do think I've kind of come to the conclusion that they will most likely hang on to Bo and Vladdy this year. Yeah. Um, which you know would sort of make a lot of sense for me. Uh, I, but, but again, nobody knows, and I will give this front office credit for this. Uh, when it comes to Bo and Vladdy, there are very few leaks about, uh, how much co- talk there's been about a new contract, what the dollar figures are, what the interest is even mm-hmm. like, there's been no leaks from this front office, uh, about that. I mean, I think the biggest, you know, I, I think the biggest thing to happen this week was Bo's interview, uh, 
uh, with the uh, with the uh, with Bay Area sports in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Where and listen, as a reporter, this is classic, man. You got a guy in your team who's unhappy. You go into a market. You talk to that guy. I mean, I did this. I lived off Tim Raines one year when he was a free agent going into every big market. Tim, would you play in St. Louis? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, I love St. Yeah. Louis. Okay, so <laughs> my story would be Reigns loves St. Louis. Yeah. Doesn't mean jack squat. Doesn't yeah. mean he's going to sign there. But of course. I found I found it interesting because I, unless I've missed it, I don't think Bo does a lot of pregame interviews I've with never other broadcasters. seen him do that before. And... That's not by yeah. I know Bo enough to know that's not by accident. Yeah, and of course now he's got another year left before he's a free agent. Uh, he, you know, he can't. I mean, I guess if he wanted to go in and demand a trade, he could. I, I don't think that would be his thing. And no. if he did that, I'm sure the Blue Jays would say, "Okay, thanks." Well, for that. and also when you're not doing well from a contract standpoint, like why would you want to remove a player right. from the table? But this is uh, this was not accidental. This yeah. was kind of bow laying down a marker and you know we've seen it a little bit with vladdy this year as well and it's all predictable i mean (laughs) if you have these guys and you don't have them under contract of course they're going to start they're going to start sort of laying the groundwork i guarantee you bow's agent and probably his father have talked him and said hey you know what you get a chance just kind of throw it out there yeah you know, be careful what you say. And Bo's smart enough to understand to understand what he's saying and how to say something without crossing the line. And um, you know, that's. Uh, but but again, having said that, I you know I I think if if you're the Jays right now, you probably hang on to these two guys. I mean, you've got you know you've got a. There has to be a reason for people to watch your games this summer. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, it, that is just a fact. You are a TV property. And that has to factor into the to the equation here, but uh, yeah, listen, they're gonna they're gonna move all these. I, I think eventually move all these kind of miscellaneous pieces around and try to create a little bit of buffer. And if they can do something and not have to, you know, pay that repeater tax, yeah, uh, I, that's absolutely what I would do. There's no yeah. point in being in in going over the luxury tax tax to finish last in last place in the East. No. I, there just isn't. And I think even this front office can figure that out. Yeah, it seems pretty obvious that they're going to shed a bunch of salary when it comes to, yeah, the pending free agents, right? Like, it's tough to see any of those guys sticking around. And, you know, you hope Jimmy Garcia gets healthy enough before the deadline that mm-hmm. he is uh, able to be shopped because that would be kind of a major loss for them that they got one of the better relievers at the deadline who, yeah, uh, maybe you can't trade. But, yeah, it feels this is just – I've asked a couple of insiders what they think the bow contract's going to be like. And to your point about how secretive it's been – that none of them have been able to, you know, offer even a remote little, uh, of an idea, like nothing even close. And they go, that's one of the biggest questions. It's impossible to pin down. Nobody knows what that deal is going to look like. My this Just from a logic standpoint, I would think they don't have any innings moving forward to trade the pitchers, which is a real problem. Is like I, I think that they should try to trade a Gossman if someone values right. him. Absolutely. Yeah, but what are you going to do next year? Like <laughs> you have Yair Rodriguez, no Manoa. Right. Like the Bowden Francis experiment was uh, no Uh, like you literally like, where are you getting the innings? Like, that's why I'm like, keep Chris Bassett, because who wants him to be a playoff starter? You need the innings next year for some kind of a baseball team. I I don't know where you're going to get it. But Gossman, I would trade if he was if a team really coveted him and they thought he could be a playoff starter. No question. No question. But the Bo situation seems to be the one that this offseason will hinge on. Right. That it'll be, hey you got to try and re-sign Vladdy. He is the face of the franchise. He is the most popular player, and he is coming off of a better season. Fine. Bo ends up being the guy where either he takes something that is team-friendly-ish and yeah, maybe shorter. Doing. Yeah, right. So he ends up being gone in the offseason. That this isn't a question about now, it's about then. Yeah, and, and I'm okay with that. Like, of course. I, here, here's what my approach – here's what I like seeing teams do at the trade deadline. Um. I like seeing teams trade pitching at the trade deadline yeah. because teams will overpay for pitching. Literally, you know what? Everybody says you can't have enough pitching. <clears throat> it's true. You can't have enough pitching. Uh, I am more inclined to hang on to my position players and move them in the off season because then I can get a read on what the market is. Uh, then I have a better understanding of what other teams are going to be doing. 
Mm-hmm. Um, in the case of Bo, there will be a number of teams who already have shortstops. Those shortstops are going to be a year older. Bo is still going to be a young guy. Whatever his defensive liabilities are, he's still going to be a youngish guy when he hits free agency. And I think there are teams out there that might look at Bo and say, you know what, we'll sign Bo to be our shortstop, take a pre-existing shortstop, somebody we already have, mm-hmm. maybe move him to another position. So I think the market for Bo in the offseason is much bigger than the market for Bo right now. But and, and this is the thing that puzzles me, you know, Bo is already under contract through next year. Theoretically, it should be easy to talk extension with this guy because you've already agreed on what you are pay, uh, what you're going to pay him for next year, right? You you've got that you've got that dollar figure in writing. He and his agent have agreed that this is what you are paying him for next year. So then the question becomes: All right, we've agreed on your value up to this point. Now, how do we see that value moving forward? The final year of Bo's contract should serve as a jumping-off point for a discussion on his free agent contract. Vladdy has gone year to year, gone through arbitration, and I think for that reason it might be a little harder to come up with a valuation for Vladdy. Mm -hmm. But I'm with you. I think Vladdy's the guy most likely to sign here. Um, You know, Vladdy has... Is, has openly said he'd like to sign here. Bo's always kind of approached it through, yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah, why not? Um, yeah, if they talk to me, yeah, I sure, I'd be interested. But, I mean, you don't get the sense that that Bo absolutely positively needs a, uh, you know, a, a contract from the Blue Jays to be to be happy. You, mm-hmm. you don't get the sense that 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 he would at all be averse to going someplace else. Even when he did that free agency thing, you're like, buddy, mix in the uh, Toronto's the place I want to be. You know, like that uh, that's usually the standard uh, free agent throwaway line that says obviously right. this is where I want. He doesn't even give you that. So But I I will say this though that when people I I always caution people about this when they talk about Bo. Take a look at the contracts free agent shortstops have gotten in the yeah. last five years. Yeah. They've all, all, all broken the bank. Yeah, except I mean, for kind have. of Correa, but that was a stupid one. I was, like, looking at the Twins the other day. He's exactly. been awesome, and everyone went, oh, maybe he's going to be hurt. Like, good job. To, uh, what was it, the Mets well, that backed down on that level? Uh, San Francisco had him signed, oh, basically. Oh, it was San Francisco, and then, yeah. And like, then pulled out of it. Yeah, and he's so, been, like, uh, one of the better hitters at the position for the last, like, three years. But, yeah. Right, but... Those elite shortstops, they don't, quote unquote, settle for uh-huh. a contract. They get big money. Yeah. And Bo has not had a great year, but, you know, he's a guy that most people in baseball think is capable of winning a batting title. I mean, and you just look at his track record. His track record over the past three years is pretty good. This year he hasn't been healthy. And, and if, if there's a concern about Bo right now, and I, I don't think I would like hammer this point to death. Yeah. But the last two years, he started to pick up nagging injuries. Mm. And that's something we didn't see from him. We always used to talk about. Good point, how, though. Well, the thing with Bo and Vladdy, man, you know what? Mm-hmm. They They're play. out there every day. Yeah. They play every day. And now you can't really say that about Bo. So that's the one, the one kind of cautionary thing. Yeah, I mean, let's see where this injury goes. You know, if this is a an IL stint, um, okay, that's that's fine. An IL stint over the All Star break, that's almost like an administrative procedure. But if it's something longer than that, now you're getting into now you're getting to a point with Bo where you're looking at him and going, okay, is this is a couple of years now where he's had this, these injuries? Um, what does that suggest? Uh, does it suggest he may have to move position? Um, you know, that's something that that I think has surfaced this year that didn't that didn't exist before, and it's one of, I mean, it's one of Vladdy's selling points. You know, yeah. Vladdy's hurt right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can tell watching him swing after taking that Garrett Cole pitch in his hand. But you know what? He's still playing. Like the dude posts up, and even if it says a DH, he still posts up. And and that's that's the thing with Bo. I'm. I'm starting to wonder about right now is how much how much does a guy how much does it take for a guy to be hurt before other teams go yeah 
uh, I don't know if there's something here. Maybe he really does need to switch position or – or maybe there's something else at work here. This is why I don't get why the Dodgers aren't a little bit more desperate, though. It's like I, I think you even wrote a piece where you went, yeah, you want Gavin Lux, and that's what everybody says. You want Gavin Lux? And I go, no, no one wants to trade Bo for Gavin Lux. But ultimately, if you're the Dodgers, why wouldn't you want the guy in the building to try to make that assessment over the course of a season and a half instead of one off season? And, yeah, maybe they can do better addressing that position uh, during this offseason, whatever. But, you know, I saw them last night. They, they, got, they just got swept. This got swept yep. by the Phillies. And I'll tell you too, the Phillies looked better. That wasn't one of those series where, and I know they're missing Mookie Betts and it's not a fully healthy Dodgers team, but you're kind of all in right now with mm-hmm. this team. You just went out and got Shohei. You know, Mookie Betts is going to turn 32 years old this year. Freeman's not getting younger. Like, that's not, this isn't some team that looks like they're going to be uh, competitive with this group for the next five, six seasons. I don't know why they wouldn't get a little desperate at this deadline and start to tighten up and go, yeah, do we really want to risk letting Bo get hot? during the final stretch of the season and then have him enter this, this uh, off season where the blue Jays uh, entertain multiple suitors for him. Like, why are they not a little bit more desperate for him? I, I don't, I've never been able to get, understand that. I, the only thing I'll, I'll say is, you know, it, it's really funny how this works, but the more often you hear a team connected with the player and the yeah, trade, the more rumor, fake it's it almost is. like the less likely it's yeah. going to happen. Like if it was going to happen, you would think that the Dodgers would have, that that both sides would have come to a conclusion right now. I, I'm with you. I don't – listen, I, I don't think the Dodgers right now um, – I don't think they could beat the Phillies. You know Alex is going to do something. And if yeah. Alex does something, the Braves are going to be a factor in the postseason. Uh, yeah, I, I – to me, the Dodgers – but the problem with the Dodgers right now is, man, all their – you know, their, a lot of their tradable young pitchers are hurt. And that really, you know, that really impacts a trade market because if you are the Blue Jays, yeah, you've got a crying need for position players. And yes, the Jays, the one thing this front office has done well is gone out and signed free agent starting pitchers. But I've got to think if you're looking at moving Bo, you want a young control decent, arm. Exactly. Yeah. As part of the package. Um. And, and I don't know if the Dodgers have that guy right now because the mm-hmm. Dodgers, you know, part, yeah, the Dodgers will spend all the money in the world, but everybody likes young, controllable starting pitching. Yeah, a- everybody does. That's like the currency of the realm right now. So the Dodgers aren't really in a position, I don't think, where they can go out and necessarily trade away all their their young, their young starting pitching, even if they were healthy to take a run at this. Yeah. Thing. So. Um, it's good yeah, that it's, the currency of the realm is the thing that the Blue Jays have not been able to get in uh, the last ten years. Uh, like, that's good. That's a really good place you want to be, where it's like the best currency in the realm you had was Manoa. And I'm looking at it yesterday. I was thinking about this the last couple of weeks. It's been Pearson is their number two success story, and it's a huge failure. Like, I was watching Paul Skeens yesterday going, that's kind of what we thought Pearson yep. could be. Like, that yep. was what we were dreaming on, is that this guy was going to go out here and throw just filthy, filthy, filthy heat, and we were going to go, look at the guy that we have for the future. And nah, we don't have skeins like that. It didn't turn out to be that. And, and the thing that's really that, that's frustrating is not only, I mean, they don't have, they don't have any help. They, most of their top pitching prospects, I think all of them now, hurt. are hurt. So all of them are hurt. You look at, that's what I'm saying about, what drives me crazy about this deadline when it comes to the trading pitching, like you mentioned, that this is the time of year where people will pay a premium. I just can't see how they could trade a Barrios or a Gossman who might go for uh, like a good price because they just they how are they going to put together innings next year? Like you're going to make Bowden Francis and everybody start. Who's even the guy behind Bowden Francis? Like who's 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 pitching no, I, for this team beyond those guys? Like they've got nothing internally that you can rely on for innings. It's it's depressing. It feels like they're in a corner where they can't make some of these moves like the Gossman one because they just. They they can't afford the innings next year. They need them. Yeah, in a vacuum, okay, yeah. in a vacuum, non big time TV property, you know, whatever. In a vacuum, the Blue Jays should be tearing down. Of course, they should be tearing down, and you know, doing it, do, and it, doing it at a time where. The Orioles are going to be good for the next decade. The Yankees, I mean, they're going through a lull right now. But sure, but they're they're they're, they're, they're the going to be Yankees. better than you. Yeah. Tampa Bay's always got. I mean, they're getting all their arms back. Tampa Bay is going to be good. Don't. 
be fooled by what you're seeing right now. Mm-hmm. Plus, they're Tampa Bay, so you know they've got something cooking. And Boston, to me, has been the biggest surprise in the American League this year. And yeah. I, I, I think Boston's a couple of moves away from being right up there with the Yankees in terms of being able to, you know, to challenge. So if you're the Blue Jays, you're really behind the eight ball here. Like yeah. you, you are, you are really behind the eight ball. So if you do have a teardown, you know, you're looking at probably two, three, four years to get this thing back on track. And, um, Again, in a vacuum, you would probably – that's probably what you would do. But mm-hmm. you, I, I don't think you can do it given where the fan base is, given that you've just spent all this money in a new ballpark. Again, you are a TV property. That matters. Uh, I swear to God, as a fan, I'd rather go down to the ballpark, and I feel like a lot of people – like this is where my area of expertise comes in. Is uh, like, how do you have this job? You have no area of expertise. I'm like, correct, except for one is I pay to go to all these teams. Mm -hmm. And I would, in a mid, not even a close consideration, I would much rather go see a team that's being honest about itself than a team that is trying to be something it's not. Like, you might do that for a year. Yeah, but that's they d- already did it. You wouldn't do it for two. That's what this year already was. This was your but, year to pretend you're somebody that you're not. And me as a, a ticket buyer, I- I'm not going to see this team next year. As it's current, I'm not watching Vladdy, Bo, Gossman, and the this the stuck together group like that. I'm not paying money for that. I'm just not. Yeah, I. I mean, you sound like. You know, it sounds like you're. It makes me think that I'm doing Blue Jays talk right now. Sorry, that, guys, but no, <laughs> it, no, it's it's uh, you know. Well, at least you know, a good caller, JD from Midtown. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's blue west. I, yeah. Listen, that's what that's what uh, I mean. That's how that's how that's how people feel. Yeah. Uh, but I, yeah, it's it. It's just it's really it's. It's difficult, right? And we haven't even touched around. I think the issue that really concerns Jays fans is okay if if we do assume that you got to tear it down and rebuild it, and I think you know where I'm going. Here, yeah, are these the guys you want tearing it down and rebuild? The ninth draft for them, and they're the worst at it, and they're letting yes. Atkins continue to do it. And it was like, what? Yeah, <laughs> the, the, this is the one guy that, that had a good draft in DNS's piece. They were like, get out of here. We can handle it. Uh, they got mad at, uh, at at Anthopolis because they were like, the cupboards are bare. It's like, I don't remember it ever feeling like this. Like Ricky Tiedemann goes down like Ralvis Martinez now pop for steroids. I, I could not tell you who the guy is right now outside of Niemela who's 18 years old. Like, yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, Lee, uh, uh, Alex leaving the cupboard bear. I mean, what did he sacrifice? Yeah. Jeff Hoffman's yeah. the one guy who's not. Jeff Hoffman's he's having a great reliever. year for great Philadelphia. Reliever. That's he's it. A, he's a great reliever, though, and it took him four years yeah. to be that. So, yeah. yeah, the whole leaving the cupboard bear thing it, to me is, yeah, you know, it's when further I, proof that they actually didn't know anything about prospects. Well, when I hear an organization say that, you know, well, the, the, the cupboard was left bare, that suggests to me that what you're saying is in code, we really haven't done a great job drafting Mm -hmm. and you know for the longest time i i used to drive me nuts when you talk about the astros and people would say well yeah of course they had to finish in last place all those years to get the draft picks and uh, but my point is yeah but they made them count yeah they won and then they went out and they signed they signed good players and pitchers internationally i mean that's what they built their team on you know, I always tell people, okay, you talk about the Astros. How come the Rays are so good? Last mm-hmm. time I looked, they weren't finishing last every year. What about New York? The Yankees are good. They're not finishing last every year. Yo, yeah, Baltimore finished last. Obviously, there's an example. I look at other teams. Minnesota seems to always be around. How often do they finish last? Mm. St. Louis was around for a long time, right? How often did they finish last? So you can go, every, you, you, you can go around and come up with these teams that had success and were still able to find players later in the draft or in the middle of the draft that have come through. And I mean, the Jays, you know, the Jays have got a bunch of, and this is no disrespect to Spencer Horowitz because I think he's going to be the opening day second baseman next year, but that's kind of, that's what they're hanging their hat on right now. Yeah. It's like right? they're, they're like, uh, yeah, benches. And that's okay. Yeah. If he's, that's okay. If you got one of those guys, yeah, 
That's great. But yeah. you can't have five no. and expect to put a major league team on the field. No. Hey, uh, Jeff, I think I told uh, Mike to be like, hey, don't worry, we'll keep it short. And we went uh, no worries. So. It, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I had a lot. I had a lot to say today. Yeah. I needed it, and I'll have more to say later. So yeah, perfect. I can't wait to listen to the show later today. Uh, Jeff Blair, uh, Blair and Barker. Thanks for making time today, man. No worries, boys. Be well. Uh, you too.